Thank you, Dr. Fauci. It is incredible to me that we can get through so much material in such a short period of time. Um, so we've talked about the science. We've talked a bit about medical countermeasures. Um, but another big area of concern is governance. And so to talk to us today about global governance to bolster preparedness for pandemic influenza, we have David Fiddler, who is an adjunct senior fellow for cybersecurity and global health at the Council on Foreign Relations, and is also the James Lewis Calamaris Professor of Law at, Indiana, at the Indiana University Morris School of Law. He is an expert in international law, cybersecurity, national security, terrorism, counterinsurgency, international trade, among other things, and serves on a number um, of consultant and advisory roles for the CDC, the World Health Organization, as well as several other federal agencies. He has also served as chair for an International Law Association study group on terrorism, cybersecurity, and international law. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming David Fiddler. As you heard, I'm a lawyer, and I was told I can't charge billable hours for PowerPoint slides, so I don't have any. <laughs> We've all seen those black and white pictures of the hospital wards that are filled with victims of the 1918 influenza pandemic. We also know that that pandemic ended tens of millions of lives prematurely. And we've asked, how could something that terrible happen? Now, telling the tale of the 1918 influenza pandemic doesn't actually have to spend much time on international governance. Because back then, what inter little international health government gover governance existed didn't focus on influenza. But those haunting pictures and those frightening statistics also make us ask, as we are today, can it happen again? Can it happen in our lifetime? Telling the tale of an influenza pandemic today and tomorrow would have to assess the performance of global governance concerning influenza. Indeed, today we have in place for pandemic influenza what political scientists call a regime complex that is a set of interlinked and overlapping institutions, rules, processes, and practices. This set of global governance mechanisms did not, interestingly enough, directly arise from the 1918 pandemic. In fact, it took approximately 90 years after that tragedy before in the main international legal instrument on infectious diseases specifically included influenza. What's in place today for pandemic influenza is thus a recent creation. And what we've created has yet to be tested by an influenza pandemic as dangerous as the one that darkened 1918. Now my remarks this afternoon are going to focus on two components of that pandemic influenza regime complex. The International Health Regulations, or the IHR, and the Pandemic Influenza Preparedness Framework, or the PIP Framework. But before taking a critical look at those two regimes, let me comment briefly on the larger governance picture. The overall regime complex forms and supports a web of influenza, pre pre influenza preparedness and response activities. And this works at both the functional and the strategic levels. Functionally, governance mechanisms enable surveillance, virus sharing, scientific research, development of vaccines. Strategically, this web of activities integrates national security, economic interests, human rights, and ethical values into pandemic influenza governance. Put simply, that governance web for influenza preparedness and response has been spun to mesh political calculations about the threat from pandemic influenza with public health capabilities that can actually mitigate that threat. Thus, we have to measure the sufficiency and the resilience of this governance web in political as well as in public health terms. So let me start with the international health regulations. WHO radically changed the global governance of serious health events when it revised the IHR in 2005. Before this revision, the IHR reflected an approach that originated in the 19th century and which centered on reporting cases of a limited number of infectious diseases, such as cholera and plague, and on limiting responses to the outbreaks of those listed diseases to measures which made sense on public health grounds. 
However, this regime never included influenza as a reportable disease. The revised IHR broke, ground, broke with this approach, and it requires countries to notify WHO about disease events that could constitute a public health emergency of international concern. The IHR mandates that any case of human influenza of a new subtype be reported. The regulations also require states to develop surveillance and response capacities. The IHR empowers the WHO to gather surveillance from non-governmental authorities. It authorizes the WHO Director General to declare a public health emergency of international concern and to issue temporary recommendations. And the IHR seeks to ensure that public health measures that adversely affect trade, travel, and human rights are in fact necessary. Now the ink was not dry on the revised IHR when it faced its first influenza challenge. In 2005, Indonesia stopped sharing H5N1 virus samples, arguing that it and other developing countries did not receive adequate benefits in return. Even though the revised IHR was not yet in force, arguments flew back and forth about whether the IHR required countries to share influenza virus samples. And to make a contentious story concise, the conclusion was, was that the IHR did not govern that issue. WHO began negotiations to address influenza virus and benefit sharing, and I'll come to that in a moment. The revised IHR were in force when, in 2009, the H1N1 pandemic occurred. And this pandemic was the first real test of the revised regulations. Overall, the IHR passed the test, proving it generated benefits that past, strat past strategies simply could not have produced. Granted, the pandemic didn't prove as dangerous as it first feared, but nevertheless, it did stress test the IHR. As a review of the IHR's performance observed, all wasn't perfect, as the pandemic revealed problems with country-level surveillance and response capacities and with some very questionable trade and travel measures. However, the most prominent controversies that that pandemic sparked, including over pandemic stages and vaccine access and use, those issues weren't governed by the IHR. Having passed the stress test and with, a, with, with the formal review's recommendations in hand, things looked pretty good for the IHR coming out of the H1N1 pandemic. However, the West African Ebola outbreak in 2014 was a debacle for the IHR. This governance disaster was disconcerting for many reasons including the realization that if the IHR fell apart during an Ebola outbreak, it wouldn't hold up during a virulent influenza event. The post-H1N1 review of the IHR concluded that despite the IHR's performance, the world was ill-prepared for a severe influenza pandemic. Various post-Ebola efforts to strengthen the IHR are underway, but given what happened during the Ebola outbreak, it is hard to argue today that the IHR has left the world well prepared for a dangerous strain of influenza. Turning to the PIP framework, we need to go back to Indonesia's decision in 2005 to stop sharing H5N1 samples. This act constituted a demand for equity in global health governance concerning influenza. And that demand was then backed by the use of sovereignty to force benefit sharing onto the diplomatic agenda. The demand asserted that the influenza virus sharing system produced benefits such as access to vaccines that mainly went to developed countries. Indonesia and its supporters argued that the IHR did not apply to virus sharing and, and that under the Convention on Biological Diversity, countries had sovereignty over biological materials, including pathogens found in their territories, and that these countries could mandate benefit sharing in return for access to influenza virus samples. This viral sovereignty controversy led to intergovernmental negotiations on a regime to facilitate pandemic influenza virus and benefit sharing on an equal footing. And hard-fought negotiations produced the pandemic influenza preparedness framework in 2011. Unlike the IHR, the PIP framework is not binding under international law. But like the IHR, the framework involves some very innovative governance. The framework facilitates virus sharing needed to prepare for influenza pandemics, and it creates flows of benefits back to the countries that share viruses. The framework incorporates the private sector, 
providing sample access to companies in return for benefit sharing and financial contributions. Generally, the PIP framework has worked. On benefit sharing, for example, WHO reports that under the framework, vaccine manufacturers have promised to deliver 350 million doses of vaccines during an influenza pandemic, and they have contributed over $100 million for strengthening pandemic preparedness and response capacities in developing countries. Indeed, some experts believe that the PIT framework has been so successful that it should be expanded to facilitate the sharing of, of samples and benefits for pathogens beyond pandemic influenza. However, concerns about the PIP framework have been raised, and let me just quickly mention five. First, WHO observed a decline in virus sharing after it peaked in 2013, and WHO identified a myriad of problems that complicate timely and adequate virus sharing. Second, WHO is assessing what problems the sharing of genetic sequence data about influenza viruses might be causing the PIP framework's balancing of virus sharing and benefit sharing. Third, concerns have been raised about the problems that the Nagoya Protocol on genetic resources might cause for the virus and benefit sharing needed to prepare for pandemic influenza. The Nagoya Protocol is a protocol to the Convention on Biological Diversity, and it applies to genetic resources, including pathogenic materials. Although the PIP framework is not inconsistent with the Nagoya Protocol's objectives, WHO has heard from numerous countries about legal uncertainty and the lack of clarity the Nagoya Protocol potentially creates for the influenza virus and benefit sharing system. Fourth, media reports about China's alleged failure to share H7N9 virus samples with the United States caused a, re a recent controversy. And some commentators argued that virus sharing had become a victim of the deteriorating trade and diplomatic relations between the United States and China. Finding out what actually happened has proved difficult, with questions arising about the accuracy, adequacy, and transparency of the PIP framework's information on virus sharing. Fifth, another worry is that the PIP framework has not been tested by a serious influenza pandemic, which raises concerns that in such a crisis, the framework's virus and benefit sharing system will break down. Will vaccine manufacturers actually deliver promised vaccine donations when a killer influenza strain threatens the world? Will the countries where those manufacturers are located permit millions of doses of vaccines to be exported when their own citizens face death, illness, and suffering on a large scale? So, in conclusion, have we made progress on global influenza governance? Even with their problems, the IHR and the PIP framework make important contributions to the governance web of influenza preparedness and response activities that now exists. For sure, it is a tangled web that we continue to weave, but we would, I believe, be in more danger without it. And we shouldn't forget that there are other governance efforts out there that support this web of preparedness and response, including WHO's global strategic plan to improve public health preparedness and response, the Global Health Security Agenda, the Pandemic Emergency Financing Facility, and the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board. However, analyzing this governance web for influenza preparedness and response reminds me of a warning issued during my graduate studies in international relations. Very often, the professor argued, webs of international cooperative activities turn out to be gossamer strands across the mouth of a cannon. In short, neither the political commitment nor the functional capacities exist to withstand a crisis when the crisis emerges. In connection with influenza, strategic interest appears to wax when a crisis happens and wane when the threat fades from the headlines. This political dynamic handicaps the functional work, such as building national and international preparedness and response capacities. We've seen this pattern with the IHR, and I think that's what the Ebola outbreak demonstrated. And we've also seen it with the PIP framework, as indicated by the growing list of concerns about it. <clears throat> 
This pattern requires many things in present and future governance efforts on influenza. But I think at the most basic level, it requires us never to forget what happened one century ago when no international government, gov governance on influenza existed. And it also requires us never to relent in our desire to ensure that the pictures and the statistics from the next severe influenza pandemic are less haunting, less haunting and less frightening for those who come after us. Thanks. <laughs>